Good evening. My name is Jason Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley, and we welcome you to another installment of the Ancient Paths. Our church meets Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. at 8630 West, 2700 South. That's Main Street Magna here in the Salt Lake Valley. If you're looking for a church that takes God and His Word seriously, that stresses the historic biblical faith, we encourage you to come and visit with us. We also meet at 5.30 p.m. on Sunday evenings. And uh, we have a mission work in Logan that meets at 6.30 p.m. that meets at 1315 East 700 North in the Faith and Fellowship Center. For the past little over a year, we have been doing this show, and our theme has been the Reformation of Christ Church. What we have tried to show is that the, the church as we see it today is often out of step with God and His Word. It has substituted traditions of men for the commandments of God. And as we see in the Old Testament, as we see through the history of the church, I think that we need to go back to God's Word and we need to see a reformation. And we need to pray that God will, would send reformation and revival. And so what we've tried to do is to bring the historic faith of the church to bear on various issues. And in, in presenting these things, I think sometimes there's been the, the idea that, that we're the ones that are somehow out of step because what people are hearing in terms of the importance of worship, not worship as we would choose to do it, but worship as God's Word instructs us, the importance of understanding the sovereignty of God, the content of our faith, the, the importance of, of the family and family worship and things like this. This is something that unfortunately is not all that well known in many churches. But we're privileged to have with us a guest this evening that I hope will demonstrate that this is something that's not happening just with us, but it's part of a, a movement to go back to the old faith, back to the ancient paths, back to something that is full in, it, in its content. Uh, we have with us this evening uh, Kenny Montano, the pastor of Roy Bible Church, uh, Kenny, good to have you with us this evening. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Um, Kenny is the uh, new pastor, or relatively new since what, November? Yeah, just since November. Of the Roy Bible Church. And you graduated from Southern uh, Baptist Seminary in Louisville back in 2005. Yeah. And there's been a lot of things happening in the Southern Baptist <laughs> Convention, haven't there? Uh, I mean, it's the, the Southern Baptist Convention has elements that are moving in the same kind of direction that we've described, haven't they? Yeah, very, very much so. You know, you have the uh, the Founders Movement, which is a is a whole movement of churches within the Southern Baptist Convention, who are seeking to restore um, you know historic Baptist theology and principles and ways of worshiping and and getting back to um, you know to really uh, the historic faith that Southern Baptists have had since the very beginning, coming out of uh, the particular Baptist movement on back to English separatists and, and beyond to see themselves as, uh, as that part of history that unfortunately in the 20th century in particular um, was distorted and, and really completely changed and almost lost. Now you, you, you mentioned the Founders Movement, mm -hmm. um, a term that's often used for those who talk about the, the sovereignty of God and salvation, that we're all dead in our trespasses and sins and that the reason some believe and some don't is not that some people are smarter or stronger or something like this, but rather the, the reason is that God have, has mercy. Mm -hmm. uh, Romans 9, Ephesians 2, etc., etc. The, um, these doctrines of grace are sometimes called Calvinism by right. 
by people who often try to say, well, that, that's not the Bible, that's Calvinism. Right. Um, it's not just Presbyterians who believe these things, is it? No, it's not. And in fact, uh, historically, um, S Southern Baptists were really founded as a result of um, understanding these things. And most of the early founders of uh, the convention and of Southern Seminary, which was the first seminary, the School of Education for Southern Baptist pastors, um, was founded on these principles. James P. Boyce, educated at Princeton, as we had talked off air, and uh, which, is a, which, for people who don't know, was a was a Presbyterian seminary. Yeah, it was, so he was educated by good Presbyterians, and and uh, you know we had disagreed uh, as we do now over the issue of baptism, and so they have a different denomination. Well, we have hope for you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you know you have the historic founding of the church um, being rooted in. The doctrines of grace, and, and I brought a couple quotes along just to just to show people how rooted that is. In 1874, James P. Boyce, who was the first president of Southern Seminary, and then in Greenville, North Carolina, um, so this is the the flagship school of the Southern Baptists, this is where all of the pastors were being educated and theology professors being educated. He said that the doctrines of grace, this is in 1874, were part of the prevailing principles which had guided the denomination's founding. And in fact, as late as 1918, so this is, you know, um, 40, 50 years later after that, into the 20th century, as late as 1918, there was a book that was printed um, by the Sunday School Board called the New Convention Normal Manual. And what the Normal Manual was, was a way for um, Southern Baptist churches to train Sunday School teachers. Here is basic theology, here is how we conduct Sunday School classes, and here's kind of your manual for doing that. It was kind of a lay leader manual. And in the second edition published in 1918, a quote from that manual said, nearly all Baptists believe what are usually termed as the doctrines of grace. And so the founders of this of Southern Baptist um, life and theology, guys like James P. Boyce, Dag, John Broadus, W.B. Johnson, R.B.C. Howe, Basil Manley, both senior and junior, Patrick uh, Mel, Richard Fuller, uh, Richard Furman, and you could go on and on were guys that believe these historic doctrines of the faith, not because of anything other than we find them uh, in, in the scriptures. The, the old Baptist Confession of Faith, which predates the, the uh, Southern Baptist founding, Second London Baptist Confession of 1689, mm -hmm. actually was modeled on the Westminster Confession, wasn't sure, it? Sure, it was. Um, that was, uh, you know, as Baptists in, in England were seeing that they needed a confession of faith because for the most part, Baptists were using the Westminster Confession up until that point and then just kind of amending those portions of it that, um, that they conflicted with issues of baptism in particular. And um, so, so what they did is they decided as a group, you know, we need to write our own confession. And so they did that and they wrote that. And the, the Second London Baptist Confession of 1689 influenced things like the New Hampshire Baptist Confession here in America and influenced uh, James P. Boyce in writing his abstract, of systematic, uh, his abstract of Principles. And the Abstract of Principles, in fact, was the very first founding statement of faith, or confession, if you will, it's not very long, but it was the first statement of faith for Southern Baptists, period. It predates the Baptist faith and message, and it was the founding document upon which still uh, uh, teachers, professors at Southern Seminary have to sign and to say that they will teach according to that abstract of principles, and it's based off of those things. It's it's Calvinistic. It's reformed. It's um, historically uh, rooted in the doctrines of grace. Now, a lot of people don't realize that there are General Baptists, which mm -hmm. are uh, sort of the free will Baptist that we see today, and some of the other movements like that. But the Southern Baptist Convention was founded specifically by you know, to use the term Calvinist, people who, who held to the doctrines of grace. And that was, that was actually the, the universal pretty much position of the denomination, wasn't it, early on? Yeah, the Baptists, Southern Baptists in particular, there's lots of Baptists in America which make this difficult. Um, but Baptists and the Southern Baptist variety came from, as I said, English separatists who were in England, who were separating from the Anglican church, and they came across... Uh, uh, the ocean there and settled in the Americas and you had Baptists in America. And then of course there was a controversy within Baptist life over um, the idea of the atonement and who Christ died for. Did he, did he die for everyone without exception in that um, uh, the only, the determining factor on, on who um, has eternal life in heaven is an individual's choice 
or did Christ die specifically for the elect who were chosen um, you know, before the foundations of the world by God? And so they, grew, they broke into two groups eventually, and those were the general Baptists and particular Baptists. The general Baptists would believe that Christ died generally for all people, and they became the general Baptists, and a lot of them stayed for some reason or another in the north. And uh, Southern Baptists came out of the group of the particular Baptists who said that there was particular redemption, that Christ died particularly for the elect and salvifically um, for them. And so Southern Baptists came out of that particular Baptist movement. So Now, let's, let's skip ahead a little bit. Uh -huh. you know, even as late as 1918, you have sort of the official Southern Baptist Sunday School manual teaching that just about everyone holds to this in the Southern Baptist Church. But by the time that, that I was in the Southern Baptist Church as a, as a teenager, um, the, the doctrines of grace I never heard being taught anywhere. And in fact, it was you know, sort of an easy believism, um, you know, walk the aisle, pray the prayer, and very little emphasis on discipleship. And on top of that, I was hearing an awful lot of, of liberalism, mm. questioning the authority of the Bible, you know, that the Bible is not the Word of God, but contains the Word of God, right. and you, you get to pick and choose what you want. Now, how did that take place? You know, when you look at the history of Southern Baptists, it's much like the, the history of a lot of groups, and I think a lot of, the, unfortunately, what became um, moderate and liberal movement in the Southern Baptist Convention actually started in, in, I think, a good place, and it was a desire to reach people for Christ. Baptists pride themselves in being um, uh, those who are strongly committed to missions and to preaching the gospel and to evangelism, and that's kind of been heralded as kind of one of the Baptist strong points, you know, that, that they have a commitment to that. Well, in the early uh, 20th century there, after, shortly not long after 1918, you began to have um, these movements of of evangelism and what you might call uh, sawdust trail preaching, where uh, evangelists were going around the country preaching in tents and sort of things, these big revivals, and, and Baptists really gravitated to this idea that they would host these things and bring people from the whole community in to hear the gospel, and, uh, and it became established uh, through the works of the seminaries that one of the ways, uh, by looking at the scriptures and seeing that the scriptures call us that if we're to be saved, that we need to confess Christ. We call upon the name of the Lord. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And um, they took that, though, and what they extrapolated from that was that, well, what we need to do is just simply convince them intellectually of their need for, for salvation, scare them that they're going to hell, convince them that, um, that if they pray a prayer, and they walk, if they come down, that's why they called it the sawdust, walking the sawdust trail. Because then these tents they would set up, they would lay sawdust on the ground out in a field as the, as the soft bed from which to, to put all the chairs. And the idea was that if you could have people walk down that sawdust trail and come forward and pray a prayer with the pastor who was preaching. And, uh, you know, and, and we've all heard these types of prayers, you know, that just say, Jesus, I, I, I believe I'm a sinner and I turn to you in repentance and faith and I trust in you for salvation. Something along those lines. And they believed that uh, if you did that, that, you would, um, that you'd be saved. But the problem is that they began ignoring the historic doctrines of um, that there was this little thing called regeneration that needed to happen. And that somebody could um, intellectually maybe assent, but, if they, but it may, might not have been a, a true change of heart. And uh, so many of these people um, never continued in their, persevered in their faith. So it was rooted in that. It was rooted in Christianity being the predominant culture of the day. Um, and so the, the church really grew by, because of all of that. But over time, you know, and then you had the influence of neo-Orthodox teaching, Karl Barth and others, in uh, uh, moving toward uh, World War II. And you had all these things kind of slowly but surely as they took their emphasis off the of doctrine so that they could preach the gospel because they believed that doctrine Do was scary. Doctrine divides. And it was divisive. Nice. So let's, let's de-emphasize doctrine for the sake of sharing the gospel. But the problem is they never re-emphasized doctrine. And when that happened, slowly but surely, over the course of about 40 years, by the time you get into the 1960s, um, especially at the academic level, in the seminaries and on a national level, the convention looked nothing like it would have when it began, um, you know, uh, in 1845 when the convention was formed. Um, you had liberalism run amok in, in, the, in the seminaries, and these seminaries, unfortunately, were the places where pastors were being trained. And so you did. You had questioning the 
authority of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture, that maybe the Bible wasn't completely uh, God's Word, but it contained a record of, of God's Word, and that you had to evaluate it through the lens of Christ, they would say. And that's very neo-Orthodox, very Bardian um, in theology. And it, slowly but surely you had all these things until as late as the 1980s at Southern Seminary, the school that I went to, you had uh, professors praying to God as mother, who would pray, Our mother who art in heaven, hallowed be her name. You had psychology professors showing pornographic films in classrooms um, to, to, uh, to make a point, I guess. Um, you had people teaching, teaching theology who didn't believe in the resurrection, didn't believe in the virgin birth, didn't believe in the deity of Christ. And it stemmed back all from this um, de-emphasis of doctrine and its central place in the church. And so it was a slippery slope, but eventually it led to um, almost the destruction of a denomination. I saw it firsthand, and I think a lot of people don't recognize that Southern Baptists, which are seen as a, as a conservative denomination, that they were basically following right in the course of the United Methodist and, and the Episcopalians and unfortunately the, the mainline Presbyterians as well. Uh, but, but something happened in the late 70s, didn't it? Well, it, uh, it all began, you know, really in uh, 1961, believe it or not. And it was a guy named Ralph Elliott who wrote a book. He was a professor at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Kansas City. And he wrote a book called um, The Genesis Controversy, or this was called The Genesis Controversy. He wrote a book about Genesis. And in that book, he um, basically said that Genesis 1 through 11, the creation account, was mythological. It didn't really happen. It was just um, there to give us an idea and teach us a few things about God, but we shouldn't take it as historical. And this wasn't actually just any old book. This was written for a series of commentaries yeah. published by the denominational press, Broadman Press. Yeah. yeah. So the very first volume in this uh, official Southern Baptist commentary series says, says, this. Th says yeah. that Adam and Eve and uh, Noah and the rest of them were all myth uh, mythological figures. Yeah, these are not true accounts. This is not historical. And it was never meant to take. And of course, all this is coming uh, from the influence of Darwinism and evolution within um, academic circles. You know, he even taught that Melchizedek, which is very interesting to me what he taught about Melchizedek, the, 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 the priest who, to Abraham who he offers, uh, you know, he gives a tithe to Melchizedek. And, and then we learn in, in Hebrews that Jesus Christ is in fact a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Well, he taught that Melchizedek was not a priest of, of the one true and living God. He taught that Melchizedek was a priest of Baal. These were in the official documents that were being produced by Southern Baptists and being read to the world. Well, what happened was because it was now in written form, people across the denomination were reading these things and were saying, this is not what I believe. And it shocked a lot of people. Um, in 1963, they tried to revise the Baptist faith and message. And when they did that, they included a lot of neo-Orthodox language. That language, like you mentioned, of talking about how the, the Bible is just a record of God's Word. It doesn't actually, it's not, it's, not really the, it's not really God's Word, it just contains a record of it, and we have to view it all through the lens of, of Christ, whatever that means. You know, we have to um, think about, uh, is this something we think Christ would say? Does this seem to be in the character of the Jesus we know, the, the, the fluffy Jesus, I, you know, I like to call him. And it would be things such as, uh, I mean, not specifically there, but, but in some circles of Southern Baptist, they were saying things like, well, yes, 1 Corinthians 6 denounces homosexual uh, behavior, but we have to view this through the lens of Christ, and Christ is loving, and Christ is, right. you know, this teddy bear, uh, you know, Santa Claus figure who just wants to love everybody and would never reject anybody. Sure. Um, and the role of women in, in, in ministry and in the church that uh, Paul, they would say, you know, well, Paul was writing within a uh, misogynistic culture. Uh, the Jewish culture in the first century was misogynistic, and that was just the way things were. But we've evolved since then. We've come a long way since then, and so we're not really to take those things seriously. The things, the commands in Titus and and First uh, Timothy about women in ministry. Well, women weren't educated back then, but now they are, and so we ought to just ignore those parts of the Bible because things have changed. And then you had uh, again the, the the controversy over the the, the commentaries. You had a guy at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary who's still around today named Clark Pinnock teaching open theism that God doesn't really know the future. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He's just making his best guess. Um, and um, Because he believed that if God actually knew the future, then the future would be set. Yeah, and, that somehow God and, would be sovereign. And we, <laughs> and then we have, but we have to maintain free agency at the cost of everything, including God being God. Right. So you had him hey, teaching. Hey, hey. 
1976, a guy named Noel Hollyfield uh, Jr., who was an MDiv student at Southern Seminary, he did a study when he went into when, it, when he went to seminary, and he asked all of his classmates who were first year MDiv students. He asked them this question. He, he asked them to respond to this statement: "Jesus is the divine Son of God, and I have no doubts about it." Well, you and I would say that's pretty easy to say, <laughs> yes, too, right? Okay. I hope so. A first year students at Southern Seminary in 1976. Only 87% of them would agree to that statement. Okay, 87%. So but it's still a large majority who would assent to that. By the time they graduated, only 63% said that they agreed to that. So their education at Southern Seminary was causing you know, a good 20% or more of students to doubt whether Jesus was actually the divine Son of God. That was their education at the theological seminary was causing them to question the deity of Christ. Explain some of why Jimmy Carter makes the sta <laughs> theological statements he does, huh? So then you have in uh, the early 1970s a guy named William Powell who came up with this idea. He saw this happening and he said, conservatives within the convention who believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, the deity of Christ, who hold all these things as important, we've got to get the convention back. Well, how do you do it? It's such a big machine. He came up with this idea that if you elected a conservative president of the convention for 10 straight years, that you could completely change the, the leadership structure within the convention because the presidents of the convention appoint the members of what would be called the Committee on Committees. And the Committee on Committees then nominates people to the Committee on Nominations. And the Committee on Nominations nominates people for all the different boards, for all the different agencies and seminaries and mission boards within the church. And so their idea was it would take 10 years because that's how long it would take for all the current terms to expire and you could completely replace everybody who is currently serving. But it would take 10 years of doing that. And so, uh, in 1979, in the convention in Houston, uh, uh, several guys got together. W.A. Criswell, who was famous pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas, Adrian Rogers, who's now passed away, fat pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, Paige Patterson, who is now currently um, the president of Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, and Judge Paul Pressler from Texas got together and they mounted a, a movement to get as many conservatives to that convention in 1979 as they possibly could. And they elected Adrian Rogers um, as president of the convention. And he was the first in that succession of 10 years through the 80s. And was able to, essentially what happened through that time, is 10 years of conservative presidents, they were able to turn over all those boards and eventually um, bring back conservatism to the convention. Some people may remember Harold Lenzel and Battle for the Bible, that was what, 76, 77? Yeah, right it was before. just before mm -hmm. then, which helped mobilize a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So they, they elect a series of, of conservative presidents mm -hmm. of the convention. And what happens? Well, starting out, nothing happens because the liberals and the moderates within the convention think that they can mount enough of an attack and, and eventually reclaim. Because for the most part, for a long time, they had kind of gone back and forth. You'd have a moderate president, and then maybe a conservative president, and then a liberal president. And, but this was a really concerted effort on the part of conservatives. And I think it reached its pinnacle in, I think it was 1986. And I forget where it was. I think it was in Dallas, the convention was that year. And it was the largest number of convention, um, they're called messengers. If you get elected by your church to go, you become a messenger to the convention. And uh, they had 45,000 registered messengers. And with their wives and families, probably something close to 60,000 people in town. Almost shut down the streets of, of, I think it was Dallas. They couldn't actually move around. And, um, and after that time, liberals and moderates kind of began to give up. And so you have the forming in 1987 of the Alliance of Baptists, kind of an alternate group for liberals within the convention. Uh, 1990, the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship was formed in 2000. And then you had some other groups like... Uh, Later, toward 2000 and, and on, you had um, the Baptist General Convention of Texas that split, and you had uh, the same thing happen in Virginia, and just as late as 2002, uh, you had that happen in Missouri, where moderates and liberals um, and conservatives split and kind of formed alternate uh, conventions. Now, I know that some of the churches in the Southern Baptist Convention were put out because they were they were ordaining women pastors. They were uh, they were receiving homosexuals into membership that were practicing without repentance. Uh, do the Cooperative Baptists receive them, as far as you know, or I mean, it, the, the CBF? Yeah, I think they do um, for the most part. Most of years, a lot of CBF churches are are, are moderate to to liberal. 
There's very few any any conservative ties in there, so they would receive those types of churches. I, I remember in Savannah, the the pastor of First Baptist Church, which was Southern Baptist, uh, up until I think mid '80s or so, mm -hmm. or, or about the time that the CBF and these others started forming. Uh, he he preached a sermon in which he said, "Does it really matter whether Jesus was divine or not? What really matters is the example that he has given us." Yeah. Well. That's no gospel at all. Yeah. I mean, if, if Christ is not divine, then I'm still in my sins. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, um, then those that have died, I mean, 1 Corinthians, uh, what, 15, you know, we're without hope. Mm -hmm. And um, and yet it, it, it sounded good to a bunch of uh, country club folks that, yeah. that wanted their ears tickled. It was a nice gospel. It was a gospel that didn't demand much of you. And it was a gospel that simply basically called you to live a better life. And what's interesting, you know, thinking forward, is that though the convention as a whole has rejected a lot of that theology, in practice, a lot of the churches are not very far from that. There's so many of our churches within the Southern Baptist Convention, and, and not just within Southern Baptists, but because Southern Baptists are so large, it's such a large group, and because the seminaries educate a lot of non-denominational pastors as well. A lot of non-denominational churches fall into this area as well in that um, most of the churches uh, that you will go to won't be teaching doctrine. They won't be teaching theology. What will they be teaching? They'll be teaching things like the 12 steps to have a better marriage, six steps to raising righteous kids. Um, uh, basically, morality is what they're teaching and using the Bible as a proof text, you know, here's what I want you to say, that you shouldn't do this or you should do this. And here's a Bible text that backs me up. So very topical and not really teaching theology or doctrine, just teaching moral lessons and using the Bible as support. And what you have is that's essentially the same message, that it doesn't really matter what doctrine teaches. All that matters is that the Bible teaches us how to be better people. Well, that doesn't call people to a radical transformation uh, from a from deadness in their sins to life to new life in Christ, and, and call and call people to radical transformation. It doesn't um, require any um, serious consideration of things like church discipline, or um, uh, or thinking deeply about doctrine and theology. All it all it, many of the sermons that you hear at a lot of churches um, could be heard at self help seminars, could be read in self help books. And the only difference is, is that they use Bible verses to support their answers instead of philosophers. You know, we've gone over enough of this that I don't think I'm going to shock anybody that's been watching the show. But to me, that at least borders on if it doesn't go all the way into idolatry. Because mm -hmm. it, is, it is the idea of a God who comes to serve me. Right. Whereas the, the focus is that we're to glorify God. That yeah. he's he's not here to glorify us. I mean, he does he saves us, and there is glorification. There's there's wonderful blessings and all like this. But the heart of it all is, God is God, and He is to be glorified. Mm -hmm. And you know this, what people want is a genie in a bottle. You rub the lamp, yeah. and you you he comes out. You give him the command, and then you don't have to shove him back in the lamp, and don't have to deal with him anymore. Mm -hmm. The the issue that rallied everyone. Was over, you know, these 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 um, clear uh, heresies, you know, yeah. popping up within the church: denial of the virgin birth, denial of the deity of Christ, denial of the physical resurrection, denial of the of, of biblical authority, and the, the there was you won, right? But there's more than that, isn't there? Yeah, there really is. And here's where it gets important, and here's where I have a real heart for um, for Southern Baptists, but not just for them, but for conservative churches. Because I think you and I would both admit that there are a lot of conservative churches out there, and you go to their pastors and you go to their people, and they'll say they believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, the total, complete inerrancy of Scripture. They believe in the, in the virgin birth and the resurrection, the deity of Christ. They believe all these things that conservatives fought so hard for um, through you know 20 years of, of just grunt work of mobilizing people to, you know in a political sense to get to these conventions so they could elect the right people and yet kind of at the end of it all we sit here now and I kind of wonder well so what 
To what end have we done all this? Yeah, we now have official statements, and we've got good uh, uh, theology. We've got at least these doctrines, like inerrancy and things like this, being taught, and we accept those things. But on the whole, our churches don't look a whole lot different than they did 30 years ago. You still have that same basic pragmatism, don't you? Yeah. That same basic, you know, it may not be walking an aisle to the 27th verse of Just As I Am, but it's it's more of a Willow Creek or it's more of an emergent purpose, or something. Purpose driven or whatever you want, to, whatever movement to say, you know, here's something that's working. This is drawing a crowd. Let's use that. And uh, so now it's with, uh, you know, contemporary um, methods of, of, you know, bringing people into the church. But yet at the end of the day, the methods don't look a whole lot different than what they were 30 years ago. There's still theologies that are being, teach, uh, being taught. You're, there's no um, emphasis on holiness. There's no emphasis on uh, the body of Christ holding one another accountable through church discipline. Those things haven't come back. And, and, the thing, and so to me, it's like, well, I'm glad that we now agree on inerrancy. I'm glad we agree on the deity of Christ. But what difference has it made? And unfortunately, for many churches, it hasn't made much of a difference at all. If you'd like to join in the conversation here, we're going to open up the phone lines. The phone number here is 973-TV20. That's 973-8820. And what we're discussing is the, the reformation that has been taking place within the Southern Baptist Convention over the past roughly 30 years now. And um, we have with us Kenny Montano. He is a graduate of Southern Seminary, uh, Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and the pastor of Roy Bible Church. Uh, Kenny, I, now that there's been sort of this, this triumph over this, this gross unbelief, there are people actually in the Southern Baptist Convention who are trying to go back and regain the, um, the doctrines of grace and the whole counsel of God and the things that the founders stood for. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the founders movement earlier. To me, it's striking. I saw a statistic a couple of years ago that only 10% of Southern Baptist pastors profess to be Calvinist. Right. Uh, even when it was u using you know, terms like the doctrines of grace or something sure. like this. But only 10% uh, of pastors admitted to that. But 33% of seminary students now yeah. call themselves Calvinist, which is what the, the founders of the, of the convention all uh, proud, proudly called themselves. Mm -hmm. um, what do you see going on in terms of, you know, now that inerrancy has been taken care of, uh, where do you see the Founders Movement trying to lead people? You know, it's, it's, it's really interesting to watch because it's really a movement of the youth within the, the convention. It's really amazing. There's a, there's a great book out there called Young, Restless, and Reformed that talks about this that, that you can kind of read about. Uh, this one young man's journey uh, of being young, being restless because they're in a denomination that has such a great history and yet is uh, just not just not reflecting that that heritage, and uh, and reformed, holding to the doctrines of grace. And what the founders movement, folks like Tom Askell and um, uh, Steve Lawson, and among a myriad of others within the uh, within the convention, Dr. Al Mohler, who's the president of Southern Seminary, Dr. Danny Aiken, president of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, and others. Um, what I really see them trying to do is to show people that this is a part of who we are as Baptists, as Southern Baptists. This is our heritage. Don't be afraid of it. If you're going to deny it, let's at least let's at least go to the scriptures and and let's be honest about where we divide over the scriptures. For so long within Baptist circles, um, Calvinism was kind of a four-letter word. If you were that was like you said earlier something that people would say to kind of mock you or condemn you. Well, you're, I, I think that, that pastor is a Calvinist. So that, it was a bad thing. Well, but now I think what the Founders Movement is trying to do is raise awareness that, you know what, there are those within the Southern Baptist Convention that are Calvinists, they're not ashamed of it, and that there's a lot of our young people who are, you know, we have two seminaries in particular who are really uh, Calvinistic in theology, at least from leadership. And, um, and so what they're trying to do is raise awareness that this is that this is a real deal within the Southern Baptist Convention. It's not fleeting, that uh, these people do exist, and that if we're going to have any sort of um, common ground, it's got to be over the Scriptures. And that I think most Founders Movement folks would say, we're, o we're okay if you disagree with us. We're not uh, seeking to have a homogenous unit. We would love for you to, to, to come on board and, and see that these things are taught in Scripture. 
Um, but we really want you to have a dialogue. Where for the longest time, you could not even have a dialogue that wouldn't turn into a shouting match, a screaming match at one another, and ultimately getting close to calling each other heretics if, uh, um, if you believed in, in the doctrines of grace. And so it's done a, the Founders Movement has done a really great job of doing that. And it's also a movement, I think, that has really helped to encourage pastors to say, you know what, if you're Southern Baptist, you're Reformed, you're Calvinistic in theology, it's okay, you have brothers. You have uh, other churches around the country who are with you. And um, I think that's done a lot to kind of uh, bring people out of the fold. Who A lot of pastors who were afraid to admit that that's where they stood now are able to say, you know what, this is where I am theologically and it's okay. And I think because of that, the awareness of it have brought a lot of people, especially young people, to begin looking at the Scriptures and saying, okay, what is it that you believe? And as they look to the Scriptures, we see more and more um, seminary students and pastors and lay people, church members, coming to uh, agree that the doctrines of grace, these are historic doctrines of the faith, and that they're found in the pages of, of Holy Scripture. One of the things that worries me as an outsider, you know, I, I, I cheer the Founders Movement on, I cheer on uh, these men who are rediscovering the things that I think are desperately needed in our time. Uh, as Presbyterian, I hope you all keep going and, <laughs> and, and uh, examine all your traditions by the light of God's Word, including baptism. But um, that being said, I, I cheer on what you're trying to do. And But you're... But you're finding a lot of opposition, though, within uh, Southern Baptists as well. This is not something that's being greeted overwhelmingly well. I, I, January 21st of this year, Paige Patterson, who's the president of the largest Southern Baptist seminary, Southwestern, declared uh, uh, Radical Reformation Day and wanted to re recapture the spirit of the Anabaptist. Yeah. And, you know, I know enough about Anabaptist history. I know that there were some... some Godly Anabaptists who just wanted holiness, but you know the overwhelming history of the Anabaptist is not real great. <laughs> no, no. I mean, you, you had the Zwickau prophets, you know, that claimed they were receiving direct revelations from God, and that the yeah. end of the world was at hand. Uh, you had guys like John, or, I mean, Jan Mathis uh, and Jan of Leiden. They take over the town of Munster and uh, kill anyone that won't leave town or submit to rebaptism. Yeah. They claim that they're setting up the New Jerusalem with a, it's going to be a theocracy, which, you know, it's kind of refreshing that it's somebody other than Presbyterians who are being accused of that. Yeah. They actually said they wanted to set up a theocracy and they introduced polygamy. Sounds like some other groups that came along a few centuries later. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, you know, you have guys like Thomas uh, Munzer that ends up leading an army to the slaughter of hundreds of thousands of people. And, you know, we, we see these people that portray the Anabaptist as they're all these little pietists and all, yeah. you know, very pacifist. And, you know, it was the mean old uh, reform people that were picking on them. But they leave out the fact that they were, that the Anabaptists had been involved in the slaughter of hundreds of thousands of people. And they weren't relying on the Bible. They were relying on direct revelations from God. Yeah. And it's only you know Minnow Simons who manages to to salvage some of that. But Minnow Simons himself ends up denying much of Orthodox Christianity. And so, I mean, I don't really see a whole lot in there. But these are the guys that, like Paige Patterson, says we need to recapture these, and he he despises Calvin. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. And him and Dr. Moeller uh, are, are friends, and I don't know how that works, uh, because he so despises uh, Calvinist, Calvinist theology and everything that goes with it. Um, and what, what bothers me, too, is that this is a controversy within the churches as on our heritage as well. I, I'm pretty um, confident in looking at the history of the convention to say that we didn't come really from Anabaptist roots. We came from, or we came from English separatist roots, and particular Baptist roots, and yet... Puritans, huh? Yeah, Puritans, yeah. Maybe baptizing yeah, Puritans. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, guys like Roger Williams, who founded the First Baptist Church in the United States in Providence, Rhode Island. And excommunicated everybody before he let everybody in. But Yeah, well, we had to, you he know, was, got to clear anyway. the church rolls. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, so you have, that really is the heritage, I think, as you look at history, really, um, of, of the convention and see it that way. I th their contention is that we came from more Anabaptist roots, which I just don't think you see. And beyond that, I think that they're doing that 
for the sake of theology, that they don't want to admit that Southern Baptists came. But I don't think you have to look that far back. Look at the formers, the founders of the convention, look at the founders of our first seminary, and there you'll see where, where they stood theologically. We have a phone call from Marianne in uh, Salt Lake. Good to have you with us. Thank you so much. I want to ask uh, Kenny Montano, how do you feel, what do you believe about the rapture according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16, 17, and 18? I'm sure you're familiar with these verses. Thank you so much for your call. Yeah. So This brings up a larger discussion. Have, have you reformed your views of the end times? So, uh, you know, that's, that's probably going to be another thing that will happen. I think it's kind of occurring even now. Um, but what you know, Marianne points to is, is, very, is very true that when we get into discussions of theology and, and, and this sort of thing, we, we get into a broader discussion of, of the way we view dis theology. Do we view theology in a dispensational framework or do we view theology through a covenantal framework? My personal opinion is that we should view theology through a covenantal framework. Um, that there's been one plan of God, there's been one people of God um, from the history from the time that God created man. You actually believe there was a church in the Old Testament? Uh, yeah, I really do. That there, It's that, not just Presbyterians. That there's this thing, you know, you see in the Old <laughs> Testament called the remnant of God. And there's always been the, the, the believing people of God within, within, you know, within the group, you know, that you had. Of course, you have Israel in the Old Testament. And um, so, yeah, I think uh, a lot of Baptists historically would have agreed with this. Dispensationalism was something that was invented in the 1800s, you know, and you really don't see it you know, anywhere else in church history. And I think uh, only through the lens of dispensational theology and only through those very isolated verses, looking at them through a dispensational framework, can you come to the view of a pre-tribulational rapture of the church. I believe in the rapture of the church. I just think it happens when Christ comes at the end of the age. That we when are Christ, called, we're called up to meet Him in the air. Yeah, when Christ comes, uh, when Christ comes again, He will um, raise the dead, and he will separate the, the sheep from the goats. He will s separate wheat from the chaff. And um, those who uh, died in Christ will be raised to everlasting life. And those who died in unbelief will be um, raised to everlasting punishment in hell. I, I don't think that, um, that if you take the totality of Scripture, um, and it, it, as long, if you don't look at those verses in isolation, but you look at them under the framework of what Jesus taught about His second coming, and what Paul taught about second coming and a lot of other places, what the Old Testament teaches about it, there just is no indication of sort of one and a half comings of Christ, that Christ was going to, I think the anticipation of the whole of the New Testament and the Bible was that Christ, when He would come again, that He would come again and that would be the end. And, um, and that He would, from there, establish the new heavens and the new earth. And, you know, specifically in 1 Thessalonians 4, you don't see this intervening period where, Christ takes the believers out and then time goes on for another three and a half or seven years, depending right. on whether you're pre or, or, or yeah, mid-trib. Yeah. You know, uh, what you see is the dead in Christ rise first right. and then we that remain are caught up to meet Him in sure. the air and thus exactly. we will ever be with the Lord. And you yeah. don't see all this other stuff. You have to create this crazy quilt by taking First Thessalonians and you take some from Zechariah and you take some from here and there and yonder, but you end up ignoring things like John 6 and John 12 where Jesus says that the resurrection and the, and the judgment are on the last day. Yeah. Well, and everywhere Jesus speaks of His coming again, He seems to, He doesn't anywhere, you know, I would think that Jesus of all people, knowing kind of how this was going to work, He was going to be Him that was coming back. If there was going to be some sort of a rapture of the church, that he would have at least hinted at it. But you never find when Jesus referring to his coming again, anything like that. He states he will come again to judge the quick and the dead, that he will come again to separate wheat from chaff, that he will come again and, um, and, and establish his kingdom. And that you don't have this weird intervening period where uh, you know, there's all sorts of strange things. You know, I, I think one of the easiest ways to look at it is just get a, chart, get, get a book of charts of the end times. <laughs> And you look at the differences between a straightforward kind of covenantal view of the end times, which is very easy to follow. There's, you know, Christ comes, He sets up, you know, His reign in the hearts of the of believers now in the church, uh, through the church, and then one day He'll come again, and then He'll establish His eternal kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth. And then you compare that to a dispensational chart, um, and it's just wacky. 
I, I think a whole lot of the emphasis on it comes from a lack of confidence in God's Word and Spirit. That you have to, in order to make the Bible relevant, you have to be able to play connect the dots between the Bible and the newspaper. Mm. And you have to lay out something that this is going to be the sign and wonder that's going to show because these things are going to be fulfilled in this day, no matter whether they actually are applying to this day or not. Yeah. They've been applying them to the current generation for 179 yeah. years now. Yeah. And all their previous connections have been wrong. Yeah. Uh, somebody told me that uh, uh, Jack Van Impey actually named a date uh, 2012 now, I something think. Something like that? He named Based one on back the Mayan in, calendar or something? Uh, well, he named one back in the 80s as well. But which would, uh, if he named one back in the 80s and it didn't come through, I think that would say he's a false prophet and we ought not to listen to him. You know? Well, like, like Harold Camping, they, they qualify that they're not, sure. they're, they're teaching, they're not They're not prophesying. prophesying, but it comes very close. You know, and I think there's a danger of this. Now, here's the danger. You know, this is, you know, a, a little bit off the subject, but the danger in this type of thinking is this lack of thinking about the future of the church and that the church was going to die and that it was going to be raptured away. What did this do? Well, you find in the 20th century, Christians... Um, Christian denominations like Baptists who began to fall into dispensationalism, they quit building hospitals, they quit uh, studying the arts, they quit doing all this. Their focus was again on what? It was only on evangelism. Let's get as many people into the rapture as we can. Um, say this prayer, we'll sign you up and put your name on the roll, and we'll get, you, we'll get you on that first train to heaven. And what that did is now Christians for the most part have lost our impact on society because we, we, we weren't thinking we were going to be around. And so you look at the impact that this has had. It's had a detrimental effect on Christian society, on this, on our society as a country. And it completely undermines the Christian home because if your view is that you're you're in the last generation, then you don't bother discipling your children. Yeah. You get them to pray the sinner's prayer and then get them out working for Jesus. Yeah. But the idea of actually teaching them to observe all things that Christ has commanded, right. which is actually part of that great commission. They didn't. Yeah. They, they tend to fade out after go, uh, which is not even the command. It's make disciples. Yeah. Um, and I would but, say, it really, the context there is saying, as you're going, because right. the, these were people who were going to be... It's a participle. Yeah, traveling. As you're going, <laughs> wherever yeah. you're at, make disciples and teach them to obey all that I've commanded. And in fact, I would say that it's just a misunderstanding of what the last days are. We've been in the last days since Jesus Christ was resurrected. And we're going to be in those last days until He comes again. And things are going to get, um, you know, there are these birth pangs that the world and the earth go through. Um, but even Jesus said that even He will not know the time of the end. That's why we're to be ready for the, the coming of Christ at any time. And yet, we're also to be acting as if, you know, sort of both in the same. Ready at any time, but also recognizing that it may not happen in our lifetime. So your belief is that rather than Christians basically uh, expecting things to get worse and worse and worse, and trying to figure out where they're going to move in northern Idaho and build their bunker until the rapture comes, yeah. that we can actually have optimism that the church has the promise that we have God's Word and we have His Spirit. The gates of hell are not going to prevail against us. Right. The, the, the tares don't choke out the wheat. The wheat don't choke out the tares either. Yeah. But, but we have gone from an upper room with a handful of disciples to where a third of the world at least gives lip service to the Lordship yeah. of Christ. Yeah. Um, and I think you really see them that both the church and the church of God, as, as you will, and the, and the church of, of the devil, you know, you kind of use those two kind of things as, as, as a way to describe it, that, that the kingdom of God and evil kind of are progressing on parallel paths. That the evil, the world keeps getting, you know, uh, progressively worse and that uh, we keep finding new ways to sin and new ways to hurt each other and new ways to disobey God. And so we be, keep becoming more depraved the farther and farther we get from Eden. And yet, um, the church continues to grow. And like you said, that, that the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. The church continues to grow. Thousands and thousands upon, um, thousands, upon thousands of people are being added to the church um, every, every week as, as um, God is saving people around the world. And so the kingdom is growing. And uh, the gates of hell won't extinguish it. And so we ought to have optimism that as we sit here right now, that, there are, that there are, God is regenerating the hearts of people somewhere and that He's making new believers and that uh, the church is growing. And uh, we, ought not to, um, we ought to not to fear His coming. We ought to be ready for it. We ought to make sure we have all of our ducks in a row and be continually confessing sin and preaching the gospel and 
and doing all that, but we have the confidence of knowing that it will be in, in, in God's timing and that it, it's not, um, the church doesn't have to worry about the advances of, of Satan. You know, I think that when people shed that pessimism about the church, that things must get worse and worse because they've come up with this wacky idea that goes back to, to I think it's Giacomo Fiore back in the 12th century, that, that we're in this Laodicean church age. Yeah. Uh, which, those, those are seven real churches yeah. in Revelation. We don't read the Bible looking for the secret meaning of, you know, well, yes, there are seven churches and seven literal cities, but there's a secret spiritual hidden meaning that, that we're going to discern. And there's yeah. this, the, you know, the last church is Laodicea, and that's the current age, and, you know, we're just lukewarm, and things are going to get worse and worse. Um, and yet these, you, are the, these are the same people who say that if you don't agree to uh, uh, dispensational theology that you're spiritualizing the text, and yet they do it right there. <laughs> you know, they're doing yeah, what, the very yeah. thing that they're, that they're, you know, crying out against. Yeah, their, their literalism does not hold up to, mm -hmm. to scrutiny. Uh, it's funny how the last day becomes something other than the last day yeah. in the hands of, of dispensationalists. But anyway, the um, one of the things that I see is that it's when we begin to, to recognize Christ may come back today, yeah. or He may come back in our great-grandchildren's day. And when Christ comes, he needs, we need to be about what He has given us to do. We don't use this as an excuse to throw off these other things. And so then we begin to ask questions, how do we live? And we take things beyond inerrancy, like what you're describing, yeah. to where we, we look at things like, you know, when we, when we gather on the Lord's Day, which is a, has a, something they actually need to discover more yeah. in itself. But when we gather on the Lord's Day, what are we supposed to do? Where do we find the altar call in Scripture? You know, it's yeah. another 19th century invention. Where do we find these things? I think that then you have a groundwork to begin to say, wait a minute, we're called to worship God. And that's a good thing. And that's, that's not just for our edification. It's what we were created for and what we were redeemed for. Yeah. And as we worship and we glorify God as the infinite, eternal, sovereign Lord of the universe, and that Jesus Christ, being the creator of all things, yet was that same one nailed to a cross outside Jerusalem. As we glorify Him, we're transformed. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so... If, if our focus is on, um, you know, is that spot on Gorbachev's head the mark of the beast or not? <laughs> um, you know, it's real easy to get freaked out over things and not be of much good yeah. of what God has called us to be. And, but, and if we, but if we're actually focusing on who God is, then we, we get transformed because, wait a minute, God is God, and I don't have to be. Mm -hmm. and, and much more, I think, even um, insidious... Than, than, than weird things like, like you speak of is, yeah. is like it, we've talked about earlier that the prevalent culture that says that church is for you, that you have churches that, uh, that say that by their very nature of being are proclaiming that this is all about you, that the music is set to, to your tastes and that um, we're going to have an atmosphere that is comfortable for you and that we're going to teach um, relevant messages for you and that we're going to aim our ministries at you and um, we're going to have all these structures and programs set up to, to satisfy you. And so now, what's unspoken in all that is, I am God. Yeah, well, and we, and we just, we unwittingly, um, we forget that Christ, the, the, John Piper says, you know, very clearly, and I think in one of the ways that, that uh, in a very pithy way, and, and that is that, that Jesus Christ is the goal of the gospel. He, rec you know, in Colossians, he talks about that, that Christ reconciled a people, but it, doesn't go, it, does, it goes on to say why he reconciled a people. Why did he reconcile a people to himself? To present, to present us before God holy and blameless one day. Mm -hmm. he, that the goal of this was not just so that we would have um, uh, better lives or that we would become rich or that we would be all this, but that one day Christ might present us as a gift to God. 
that it's not it's not just for our benefit. We're, we kind of get a side benefit. We we are we are um, joint heirs with Christ and all these wonderful things. We've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Um, but Jesus Christ is the goal of the gospel, and, and and Piper puts it very succinctly. I think when he says he asked the question, he said, if if you could go to heaven, and all of the benefits of heaven would still be there. The streets of gold, the mansions, the uh, you know, life everlasting without any more tears, no more suffering, no more pain, no more disease. But Jesus wasn't there. Would you be okay with it? And what he says is that probably for a lot of people would have to really think about that. Why, why are you um, devoting your life to following, as you say you are, to, to following Christ? For a lot of people, I don't know that they could answer that question the right way. Which is, and the idea is that if... If Jesus Christ is not the treasure of your heart, if He is not the reason you, you go to church, he's, if Jesus Christ glorifying Him and honoring Him is not the reason why you worship, if He's not the reason why you study, if He's not the reason why you pray, if He's not the reason why you um, raise, uh, try to raise a good family, if He's not the reason why you try to live a good life, if Jesus Christ is not your ultimate treasure, then you really haven't understood the gospel. And you're really an idolater yeah. because you're doing it for some other reason. Yeah. Well, you know, you go back through the Old Testament, you go through the, the history of the church over and over. Human traditions have obscured the simplicity and profundity of God's Word. And we have had to go back to the Word, back to our knees, and to reform. And I rejoice that there is a reformation that is taking place in the Southern Baptist Convention. And um, pray that it will continue. And pray that it will keep, that they'll... <laughs> Go back and re-examine those things they didn't learn at Princeton back in the 1800s <laughs> about baptism. Those things we improved upon, we'll uh, do. Yeah. I'm going to talk about that next week, actually. <laughs> Kenny, wonderful having you with us. Appreciate it. Well, we are drawing to the end of a, another episode, and it has been a great pleasure to have Kenny Montano with us. Uh, we rejoice to see that there are others that see the importance of reform and see that this is not the first generation reading God's Word, that other generations have had that Word, and they've had His Spirit, and are coming to similar conclusions. We meet Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. at 8630 West, 2700 South. We meet Sunday evenings at 530 p.m., have a simple meal that follows. We invite you to worship with us. If you're looking for a church that holds to those doctrines of grace, holds to the historic faith of the Christian church, we invite you to worship with us soon, either here or in our mission work in Logan. For more information, you can check out our website, and we will be back next week. Until then, we wish you God's blessings. Good night.